Thank you. If we could uh, just start with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Eternal Father, in the most holy name of Jesus, by the infinite merits of his most precious blood, we beg thee to send us thy Holy Ghost, that uh, we may hear and know your will for us. We ask this by the powerful intercession of Blessed Mary, ever virgin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, what, a, what a great joy uh, to be here with you. Um, I must say that I'm from Canada, and you know that what we hear of Irish is always the fighting Irish. And I was very pleased when um, Anthony and John got a hold of me to come here because I realized how much of the fighting Irish they actually are. The thing is, Ireland has had a huge and heavy cross to bear, and I think a cross for the world. You had the most unbelievable thing happen in 2015, and as John Lacken said, not when Ireland passed to be the first country in the world to pass by referendum same-sex marriage. Nope, that wasn't the shocking thing. The shocking thing was that you didn't get, as Cardinal Raymond Burke said, support from Rome. Yet exactly the same thing happened just now on abortion, where you got again, unbelievably, no support from Rome. So understandably, fathers of children would be incensed. But I guess it was the last straw when the same Romans who should have been here to support you through the referendums then decided to come to your country and run a conference to pervert your children with anti-Catholicism regarding these issues. So I want to commend you, you fighting Irish, for standing up for your children and our faith. Over there, 10 minutes from here, at the official conference, there is a talk being given tomorrow by Father James Martin, whom you all know. And the title of his talk is, and you'll see it up here on the board, showing welcome and respect in our parishes for LGBT people and their families. I'm going to speak to you. The title of my talk actually was designed specifically to counter that lie. Um, I was a little bit afraid coming here because the day I left, actually, uh, the largest gay newspaper in America decided to do a hit piece on LifeSite News, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you basically about how to talk to same-sex attracted Catholics with truth and love. And I think that's very important in our day and age because many of us, I'm a, I'm a father myself, as you know, of eight children, and our eldest is 22, our youngest is seven, so we're in the mix with everything going on, and many of you have children and grandchildren out there in the world, some of whom aren't living the way we'd like. And so this question becomes very real for us. My experience in this arena doesn't actually come from my psychology background. It actually comes from the man on the screen. The man on the screen is my father, Henry Weston. Yes, he's a white guy with blue eyes. <laughs> but my mom was from India, and therefore I'm a mix, and that's my dad. And my dad, whose name was Henry Weston, uh, was a very holy man indeed. Probably like many of you, he was a daily mass, daily rosary Catholic, who probably like many of you was called a fanatic for his beliefs. At every moment of my life, I remember him talking about God. I remember him getting a haircut, and my aunt who was cutting his hair caught him mumbling as he was always doing during the haircut because he was praying. And when she got to the front, saw him doing that, she whacked him and said, can't you ever stop? 
His relatives would call him crazy because he gave to the poor. He was a visa officer for Canada, let people into the country. That's, by the way, how he met my mom. She was a nurse in Germany, and uh, he let her into the country. But uh, sometimes when he'd let in poor people, he would uh, let them sleep at his house. And uh, his siblings and mom who lived with him didn't think that was a good idea. His own family called him crazy, and I hate to say it, but I did as well. You see, despite being spoon-fed the faith by a great and holy man, and this is where I want a lot of you parents and grandparents to take heart, he did everything he could to give me the faith. I was schooled in the Baltimore Catechism, which you should all know is America's great catechism. I was given an example of daily mass, a daily rosary, and everything else. And yet, in my early teens, I left the faith. I had to leave it in such a way where he was still thinking I was going. I said I'd go to a later mass, went, grabbed the bulletin from the church, and went to play pool with my friends. But I had the proof. So that sad trajectory got me into a life of absolute hell, into sexual degradation, trouble with the law, all sorts of things into my early 20s, where I had abandoned God completely, such that I would probably say I was an atheist. I had to force myself to believe that Jesus didn't exist, because if it did, then I couldn't live the way I was living. Dad had given me a scapular probably when I was three. I never noticed it at all. But when I was in my teens, doing all the things I shouldn't have been doing, all of a sudden it was itchy. And after a few times, I had to take it off. The interesting thing is when I was 14, he gave me a book. Right when I was really going off the rails, he gave me a book called True Devotion to Mary, St. Louis de Montfort's great work, called by the Germans Das Goldene Buch, The Golden Book, known as the greatest treatise to Mary in the church, even though there are many this big. It's 100 pages or less. And it was the means of my conversion through his example. You see, I had a massive crisis of faith. After I got in trouble with the law, after I knew I was in a dead end, I tried to turn to our Lord, um, say in our Father. I figured that, you know, if I could make that Sunday morning Mass, that would be like an hour investment a week and I could have the Catholic lucky charm so my, wife, my life would not be so bad anymore. Didn't look bad from the outside. From the outside, I was doing exciting things, driving fast and involved with women and so forth. But on the inside, it was a living hell. And so when my life started to fall apart, as uh, God often does to us to bring us around, I was actually arrested, believe it or not, and um, thought my life was going to end. Got out of it and with a resolution to go and talk to my dad. Didn't talk to him then, tried the Our Father thing, tried the Sunday Mass thing, also didn't work, because my life was attached to all sorts of things I couldn't let go of. Once I read True Devotion, that's actually when I had a crisis of faith. Because I realized from reading de Montfort's great work that it's not a Sunday morning thing. It's an all day, every day, all night, every night, give your life away thing. And I wasn't ready to do that if this stuff was not real. So I had a speech. I literally took True Devotion, put it under my arm, and went to see my dad. And I was going to say this to him. Dad, I know only one thing in life, and that is that you love me. You've put up with all of my garbage. So I want you to tell me, because you love me, is this stuff true? Is it real? Because I know it means giving away my whole life, and I'm not ready to do that if it's fake, but if it's real, I will. So tell me, because you love me, is this true? And the most powerful thing, probably one of the most powerful experiences of my life was looking at my dad not able to ask the question. Because no words could have said to me, yes, it's true, and made me believe, but his life spoke to me. And you know what spoke to me most powerfully? It was all that persecution he received for being a daily mass, daily rosary Catholic. All the condemnation he received from his family, from his own children, that convinced me that it was real, and that turned my life around. You hear often of these miraculous turnaround conversions, in a way it was one. I was healed of many of the 
attachments that I could not break in a miraculous way. And that's why I start the topic of how to deal with this most difficult question uh, in the sexual realm with my dad's example. Because that is the example. To be faithful in your life of prayer. To make sure that we ourselves are practicing the faith in this most difficult of arenas. God was really good because when I came back from a life of sin where I rejected him, he blessed me in a way that I will never deserve. This is my family now. My wife and I, Diane, we have eight beautiful children. If you notice, the top seven we had in nine years, we lost three after the seven to miscarriage, and then we had a little miracle baby, Zachary, who's being held there by our eldest, Hannah. God also blessed me with founding LifeSite News. In 1997, Steve Jelsevac and I founded a news service that was really tiny. Um, it was basically to get out the pro-life news because we noticed as we went to our March for Life, none of the media was picking it up. You'd go to the March for Life in the U.S., 300,000 people are there, people are stuck in traffic for hours, and the husband gets home and says to his wife, dear, you wouldn't believe it, there was this massive demonstration, I, that's what took me so long, I'm so sorry I'm late for dinner. They watched the evening news, nothing. And she turns to her husband and says, sure, there was a big march. <laughs> so we knew it was ridiculous. We started a little news service that I, I literally sent first by email, actually, in 95, to uh, a bunch of friends. And then in 97, Steve Jelsevac, who you see there right in the center, he put up a website, um, and we put the news on the website, and hence the birth of LifeSite News. LifeSite News now uh, receives about 60 million page views a year every year. We had our annual retreat uh, a week and a half ago in Virginia, and 43 people were there, which included our board and staff. So it's become uh, quite the thing none of us, neither of us could have imagined when it began. Going all around the world, we've been able to meet saints, quite literally saints, and very many of you saints. And I say that with great respect and admiration for so very many of you whom I love. Um, and <clears throat> we were in trouble. Remember how I told you the day we were, I was going to leave? That was on the 20th, a couple days ago. Um, the largest homosexual paper in America did a hit piece on us. Well, here is the hit piece. It was Meet LifeSite News, one of the most anti-LGBTQ online outlets. You know who this is really by? This is by that Soros-funded group called Media Matters. It was Soros, by the way, who funded both campaigns um, in Ireland, uh, both the same-sex marriage campaign and the abortion referendum campaign. Uh, and that same fellow funded this hit piece on LifeSite News, so much so that I was kind of afraid I might not be able to leave the country. In it, it says, LifeSite News is one of the most virulent anti-LGBT outlets out there. And that's Brennan Suen, Media Matters LGBT program manager. And she said, um, LifeSite essentially serves as an extended communication shop for extreme anti-LGBTQ groups. And it's a go-to platform for an anti-LGBTQ <laughs> extremists and groups producing some of the most extreme anti-LGBTQ content around. We kind of wear that proudly as a badge of honor at LifeSite News. So, <clears throat> to understand what I'm about to talk about, it's good to be in a good frame of mind. And I often tell young people this when I start speaking with them. I say, I want, to imagine, I want you to imagine two lines. One line, starting at my shoulder here, going up through the roof, and out into the clouds, actually out into outer space, and it just keeps on going. Got that line? Now I want you to imagine a second line. Also starts at the same point at my shoulder, but it goes down this way, down through the floor, down the other side of the world, out through the sky, and the universe that way, and just keeps on going and never ends. Those two lines, of course, are the lines marking eternity. And at my shoulder, there's a point thinner than this sheet of paper. And that marks our life. If we lived 120 years, anybody here think they're going to live a longer than 120 years? We got 
one or two in the back. That's great. <laughs> but I know I won't. And most of us realize that we're definitely not going to live another 120 years, regardless of how young we are right now. And the thing is, it's in that short span of time, less than the thickness of this sheet of paper, where we decide for all eternity where we're going. That's the seriousness of what we're dealing with here. And that's the seriousness we need to convey to all those in our lives who are conflicted with sexual, um, sexual confusion, aberration. These children you know very well, Lucia, Francesco, and Jacinta, and we all remember that we celebrated the centenary last year of the great visions that they had from Our Lady of Fatima. The first vision they had, of course, was the vision of hell. They saw a great sea of fire and so on. I won't read it all, but the whole quote is there, the direct quotes from Sister Lucia describing what they saw. It's interesting that the first vision was a vision of hell because Our Lady wanted to point to the errors that were upcoming. And one of the most severe right now is this doubt in the existence of hell, if not the existence that anybody actually goes there. Or as some others have put it, that the soul doesn't go there and if they don't want to go to heaven, they're annihilated. Our Lady warned us about those heresies a hundred years ago. She also told Yatsinta something very interesting. She said, more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than for any other reason. She also said, fashions will be introduced that will offend our Lord very much. She also said, woe to women lacking in modesty. It was another warning because she knew what was coming. But she said at the time, 1917, that more people go, more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than for any other reason. Lucia was pointed out over and over again how those were sins of impurity. You know what's really weird? A lot of people say, oh, it was so much worse in the past. Come on, what we're going through now is nothing compared to what they went through in centuries past. You know what's really weird about that? Our Lady said that in 1917. In 1917, there was no pornography on a video nor a magazine. There was no internet. There are more people today who view pornography regularly than there were people alive in 1917. And it leads to hell. Here's an interesting quote. This is by an atheist, an atheist in America who ran a very popular show called Penn and Teller. And this fellow's name was Penn Gillette. And in 2008, he said these words, remember, from an atheist. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and that people could be going to hell and not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that that's not really worth telling them that because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? It's hate not to tell same-sex attracted Catholics that gay sex leads to hell. It's not love, as what it's painted like 10 minutes walk from here. I want to tell you why and how you can explain this to your children. You know, there's many, many, many studies showing the detrimental effects to the body, to the mind, to the emotions of same-sex behavior. Many studies. They're on LifeSite, many of them, for years now. We've put them out. There's a shorter lifespan of 20 years. There's all sorts of abuse. And then there's, of course, all the sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV AIDS. So often, though, if you get into debates with people about this, they don't believe you. Your young people will say, oh, you're reading those studies. Duh, you can't believe that. That was all written in the anti-gay ages that you're from. Really, I tell them. Well, let's look at the gay activists themselves. 
And so this is from the Canadian newspaper Extra, which is our biggest homosexual magazine in Canada. This was from February 17, 2009. Remember, in Canada, we passed same-sex marriage in 2005. So this is four years after the passage of same-sex marriage. Jens Helquist, the executive director of a homosexual activist group, he went to the government to ask for more health care dollars for the LGBT community, and here's what he said. He said, we have one of the poorest health statuses in this country. Health issues affecting queer Canadians include lower life expectancy than the average Canadian, suicide, higher rates of substance abuse, depression, inadequate access to care, and HIV AIDS. He said, there are all kinds of health issues that are endemic to our community. We have higher rates of anal cancer in the gay male community. Lesbians have higher rates of breast cancer. The reality is more LGBT people in this country die of suicide each year than die from AIDS. There are more who die early from deaths of substance abuse than die of AIDS. Now that we can get married, everyone assumes that we don't have any issues anymore and a lot of the deaths that occur in our community are hidden. We don't see them. Those of us who are working on the front lines see them, and I'm tired of watching my community die. Don't believe us. Don't believe the studies. Believe those who are in the LGBT community who have spoken out themselves. This lifestyle harms your body, your mind, and your heart, but it also harms your soul. And it is hate not to tell same-sex attracted people that. One of the very hard issues that we deal with nowadays is this whole transgender phenomenon. And rather than speaking to it, I'm going to show you the most effective tool for convincing someone how ludicrous this is and just play it from Dr. Cotella right for you here. Listen up. Essentially, transgender ideology holds that people can be born into the wrong body. It's simply not true. Human sexuality is binary. Okay, we know this because in nature, reproduction is the rule. And human beings, uh, we engage in sexual reproduction. You need a man and a woman to do that. Women are XX. Those are the sex chromosomes. Women have two XXs men have an X and a Y. Those are genetic markers. They're genetic markers for female and male respectively. Okay, binary, that's the rule and it's self-evident. Transgender, someone who identifies as transgender, however, that's not a problem in their body. Gender identity, all identities, they're in our thoughts. Thoughts and feelings, those are not hardwired, they develop and they may be factually wrong or factually correct. Uh, the definition of a delusion is a fixed false belief. So if I persistently, consistently insist that I am Margaret Thatcher or persistently, consistently insist that I am a cat or uh, I'm an amputee trapped in a normal body, I am delusional. And in fact, there are people who believe they are amputees trapped in a normal body they are appropriately diagnosed as having body identity integrity disorder. If you want to cut off an arm or a leg, you're mentally ill. But if, but if you want to cut off healthy, healthy breasts and genitals, oh, then you're transgender and you don't have a mental illness. Individuals with disorders of sex development are being used as pawns in the fight for um, basically a civil right to a mental illness. There's no such thing as a civil right to a mental illness. But that is, in fact, what we are dealing with, with the transgender rights movement. Did you catch that? So this is a tool for you to use with your young people. This is all science. They can look it up themselves. And it's very clear, and that particularly that last example of the person with the disorder of believing that they themselves are an amputee trapped in a normal body, wanting, and they do, cut off their limbs. But it's recognized as a mental disorder. Healthy limbs, chopping them off, not a good idea. Healthy sexual organs, chopping them off. Oh, that's all fine and good, that's wonderful. We'll pay for it with our tax dollars and applaud you for doing it, even to your little children. So we are definitely in a, in a strange place in today's world. Um, 
This most common line when you say anything confronting any of this is you're called a hater and a bigot. And I would say use it. Okay, so I was running a radio show and during 2004 we were debating same-sex marriage back and forth and there was this one lawyer who always called in and we always argued back and forth. And after a few nights of this, I said to him, look, the only reason why I'm saying this is because I actually love my brothers and sisters who are same-sex attracted. I use the word gay because that's the only parlance he would uh, recognize. But I said, hey, do you think it's fun to be called a hater and a bigot all the time? And in Canada, we had just passed hate crime legislation in 2004, the year preceding our passage of same-sex marriage. And I said to him, one day I might be arrested for saying these things, but I'm willing to do that. Why? Not because I'm a sadist or anything, no, uh, a masochist or anything, no, but because I love my brothers and sisters who are same-sex attracted enough to tell them this because I also know it's hate not to tell them this. His response, this lawyer who was always very wordy, was silence. Silence on radio is kind of weird, actually. People try and turn and focus the station again. But after a second, he came back and he said, you know... I hope the rest of the church is coming at it from that altruistic perspective. And really, that's the point that you want to get them to. God does all the converting, but we should at least have the evidence for the hope that's in us. In other words, we should be able to articulate in the reasons for believing the truths of the faith. And that's really what LifeSight is all about. Life said is all about providing the evidence of the truth of the faith. It's an evangelistic mission that uses news as a vehicle to transmit the faith. We had our retreat, as I told you, um, last week or a week and a half ago. And the priest at our retreat said something truly amazing. He said, we should be praying for hate. And if you live in Canada, that's really weird. But... Actually, he explained it, and I thought, gosh, you know, it's something that I really need to do. He said, we're called to pray for the grace to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. Do you remember your act of contrition? I detest all my sins because I fear the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who are so good and worthy of all of my love. I detest. How many of us, speaking mostly to myself, actually detest sins? Have we been asking for the grace to detest sin? We need to be. When I heard that at the meeting, I was really struck by it, thought of telling you all about it, and then... I thought, oh, I don't know, that's kind of a controversial thing to say. And while all of the sex sandal stuff was going on, a really hero bishop friend of mine, Archbishop Morlino, Bishop Morlino, um, had this to say, which was confirmation for me. He said, this is the bishop speaking, if you'll permit me, what the church needs now is more hatred. As I've said previously, again, this is the bishop speaking, St. Thomas Aquinas said that hatred of wickedness actually belongs to the virtue of charity. As the book of Proverbs says, my mouth shall medit med uh, excuse me, med meditate truth and my lips shall hate wickedness. It's an act of love to hate sin and to call others to turn away from sin. Bishop Robert Morlino. If you want more, by the way, about the need to hate sin, and particularly uh, the sin that we're dealing with in this talk, LifeSite News' Matthew Cullen and Hoffman translated the great work of St. Peter Damien called The Book of Gomorrah. I've got about 30 copies for any of, those, uh, any of you interested in purchasing a copy. Um, we're going to probably sell them for about 15 pounds. Um, sorry, small commercial. So... Let's turn to the church now. For all of you parents and grandparents, I hope I've given you some fodder to take this fight home to your families to help them. And you do it most powerfully in living your own life as one of holiness and inner purity yourselves. With regard to the church, 
and our fathers in faith. We have to beg them to actually do what they're called to do. Because it's tough. It's tough for us to stand up on these truths. It's tough for them as well. But they're instructed to do it. In fact, the 1986 Congregation for Doctrine and Faith document written by Cardinal Ratzinger, of course, entitled Letter to the Bishops of the Catholic Church on the Pastoral Care of Homosexual Persons, emphasized the necessity of, quote, clearly stating that homosexual activity is immoral, end quote. The instruction to the bishops of the world added that, now get this, we wish to make it clear that departure from the church's teaching or silence about it. Departure from the church's teaching or silence about it in an effort to provide pastoral care is neither caring nor pastoral. Only what is true can ultimately be pastoral and the neglect of the church's position prevents homosexual men and women from receiving the care they need and deserve. This is the teaching of the church. What we're hearing 10 minutes away is not. It is actually not caring and not pastoral to be silent on these things. It's actually hate not to tell same-sex attracted Catholics that gay sex leads to hell. <clears throat> Here in your homeland, it's a sad case, very much like it is in my homeland, among your hierarchy. Ireland's Catholic bishops have caved in to government demands to provide marriage care services that include marriage preparation and marital sex therapy to homosexual couples. Now, of course, whether they're doing this or not is a different question. They agreed to it. Why? Because you have a prime minister who is himself homosexual, and they give 1.6 million euros to the bishops' conference every year to provide counseling. Of course, they want to continue counseling, but how do you do so under these conditions? Nonetheless, I guess it looks like they sold out on the faith. These are hard questions. They're not easy. In Boston, Massachusetts, where the church ran adoption agencies for 100 years, the government told them, they told the archdiocese there, that should they continue, uh, they would need to allow for adoption for same-sex couples. And uh, at the time, the archbishop said, no, we're not going to do that. So it ended 100 years of adoption provided by the Catholic Church. Now, some, you might decide whatever you want, but some went on and took the ministry and kept going with it anyway, but that's another story. The church did do this and was strong in the past, and their example of fidelity to the teaching of the church continues today. In 2005, while he was president of the Pontifical Council for the Family under the new Pope Benedict at the time, Cardinal Trujillo said these words, Parliaments which open the way for same-sex marriage destroy, piece by piece, the institution of the family, the most valuable heritage of peoples and humanity. He called homosexual marriage, and I quote, a crime which represents the destruction of the world. And speaking of adoption of children by homosexual couples, he said this, in a quote, this would destroy the child's future. It would be an act of moral violence against the child. Very strong words indeed. The Cardinal explained that it was out of love that the church is pointing out these dangerous. He said, and I quote, As I've said many times, homosexual peoples must be respected, loved, and assisted. We must help them overcome this situation if they seriously want, help, want and help them realize that there is not only life on earth, there is another life. It's false to say that the church does not love these people. She loves them and wants to lead them to eternal salvation. Pope Benedict himself, in December 22nd, 2008, he said the church must protect man from self-destruction, using the self-same words of Cardinal Trujillo. He said if the church speaks of the nature of the human being as man and woman, and demands that this order of creation be respected, it is not some antiquated metaphysics. What is involved here is a faith in the Creator and a readiness to listen to the language of creation. To disregard this would be the self-destruction of man himself, and hence the destruction of God's own work. 
on his flight to Portugal in May 2011. Pope Benedict touched on what he said when he got, just before his papal election, when he talked about the filth in the church. He said, an indication is given of realities involving the future of the church. By the way, he was talking about the secret of Fatima. And, um, and uh, he said, actually, there's more to it. He said, as for the new things which we can find in this message today, we are seeing it uh, in, a reality, uh, in, a, in a really terrifying way, that the greatest persecution of the church comes not from her enemies without, but arises from sin within the church. And that has started playing out over the last week in an intense fashion we haven't seen since 2002. Cardinal Sarah said as well on March 31st, 2017, there's a serious crisis of faith, not only at the level of Christian faithful, but also and especially among many priests and bishops. Today, a significant number of the church leaders underestimate the serious crisis that the church is going through relativism in doctrinal, moral, and disciplinary teachings, grave abuses, the desacralization and trivialization of the sacred liturgy. Our Lady of Akita, approved apparition in 1973, warned, and I quote, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against other bishops, the priests who will venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked and the church will be full of those who accept compromises. The devil will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. I don't want this to get too depressing because the times truly could be that. So I want to give you the quote from Romans 5. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And if you're following what I said earlier with regard to the availability of porn and the fact that Our Lady said more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than for any other reason, you'll realize that sin is abounding today more than ever before. But that also means that grace is abounding more than ever before. And we have that grace to call upon. We need to do that with fervor. There's a really neat story that the same priest who was at our retreat three years ago, he told another story at the time that was most encouraging to me, and I'm going to tell it to you. It's a story of a hockey game. We're from Canada, after all, so most of our stories is about hockey games. So his team had made the playoffs, and he was just grabbing his beer and popcorn. It had just started. You know, he had probably finishing confessions and was a bit late. Before he sat down, his team has lost the first goal. He was kind of frustrated by that, but nonetheless sat down to watch. And over that next first period, his team lost two more goals. Entering the second period, 3 nothing. you know, Father thought, mm, oh well, you know, we're going to strive ahead and be hopeful. But in the second period, his team lost four more goals. And he explained how with each goal, it was like a sword was piercing his heart. It was terrible. What suffering? They had worked so hard to get to the playoffs, and here they were losing goal after goal. He felt so frustrated he wasn't going to watch the third period. He was just going to go to bed, but decided to offer it up, as Catholic priests used to do, and he went on with it anyhow. He was amazed to see that in the third period, his team scored seven goals, tying it up, and in overtime, won the game. He stood up off his chair, spilled the rest of his popcorn, and applauded. And you know, 20 years later, he was watching the best of the NHL. And they were airing full games. And as he sat down to watch, he recognized they were playing his game. He sat down and re-watched that game from 20 years ago. And you know, he told me, all the goals in the first period and all the goals in the second period, I could watch with joy. Because I knew the end. <laughs> all the sufferings that the church is now experiencing, all the sufferings that we are now experiencing even in our own families, you can watch them with joy. Because you know that in the end, 
the Immaculate Heart will triumph. Our Lady, when she spoke about all of these calamities coming to the church and to the world, to souls, she said something very important. She said, to prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars, persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. How many of us are doing the first five Saturdays? How many, don't put your hands up, but how many of us are consecrated via St. Louis de Montfort or any of the other versions to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart? We have to do that for our sakes, for the sakes of our children's souls, and for the church. You know, Russia spread her errors, and we all think of communism, and it all ended, right? Well, not so fast. The first country to legalize abortion was Russia, also the first to legalize same-sex marriage, by the way. 1920, Russia legalized abortion on demand. Still, to this day, has the highest abortion rate in the world per capita. Population of 143 million, 1.2 million abortions a year. In the United States, there was an FBI, ex-FBI agent by the name of Cle Cleon Skousen. Uh, Reagan thought he was the greatest mind on the, on the notion of communism. Actually had his book, The Naked Communist, read into the congressional record. And here's what Cleon Skousen said communism really is. He said, these are the goals of communism. Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. Break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Present homosexuality, de degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. Infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools or on the, grounds, on the grounds that it violates the principle of separation of church and state. Discredit the family as an institution, encourage promiscuity, masturbation, and easy divorce. Emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Attribute prejudices, mental blocks, and retarding of children to suppressive influence of parents. Any of that sound familiar? Russia will spread her errors. On October 7th, 2012, at our Rome Life Forum in Rome, Cardinal Burke said something very interesting indeed. Something thought of by many, perhaps, as very controversial, but nonetheless, seeing the spread of Russia's errors, he said, and I quote, <coughs> regarding the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I do not doubt for a moment the intention of Pope St. John Paul II to carry out the consecration on March 25, 1984. The servant of God, Sister Maria Lucia of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart indicated that Our Lady had accepted it. But it is evident that the consecration was not carried out in the manner requested by Our Lady. Recognizing the necessity of a total consecration, from a, uh, a total conversion from atheistic materialism and communism to Christ, the call of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart in accord with her explicit instruction remains urgent. Our Lady said, and you'll be hearing this again uh, in, a, in a presentation, a couple presentations from now by a great friend of mine, great hero of mine, Dr. Tom Ward. She said in a letter by Sister Lucia to Cardinal Kafara, who, by the way, was also at that Rome Life Forum where Cardinal Burke said that. She said that Our Lady told her the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. 
And at that same Rome Life Forum, Cardinal Kafara, who, by the way, passed away shortly thereafter, said for the first time publicly that that time is now, in his estimation, over these last three years, when in the church we've been battling over marriage and the family. I want to preempt Dr. Ward's talk with some cover fire because he's going to say a lot of hard things. This is the truth in canon law about the lay faithful, that they have the right, indeed sometimes the duty in keeping with their knowledge, competence, and position to manifest to the sacred pastors their views on matters which, matters which concern the good of the church. They have the right and also, make, to make, also to make their views known to others of Christ's faithful, but in doing so, they must always respect the integrity of faith and morals, show due reverence to their pastors, and take into account both the common good and the dignity of individuals. This stuff is so confusing. It's been going on in the church for the last five years. About three years ago now, we decided to create a, Va a Vatican news magazine that covers these things because we put out 15 to 25 stories on LifeSite News every day. And to keep track of just the Vatican coverage has become a real challenge, even though we set up a Catholic section. But this magazine, Faithful Insight, I've got a few copies here for you if anybody's interested in those. It is a catalog of uh, what's been happening these last five years. One more pitch for Tom, and that is that St. Thomas Aquinas' famous quote, if the faith were endangered, a subject ought to rebuke his prelate even publicly. Hence Paul, who was Peter's subject, rebuked him in public on account of the imminent danger of scandal concerning the faith. And as the gloss of St. Augustine says on Galatians 2.11, these are all the words of St. Thomas Aquinas, by the way, Peter gave an example to superiors that if at any time they should happen to stray from the straight path, they should not disdain to be reproved by their subjects. And finally, Our Lady to Lucia on the final battle, the conclusion of that letter to Cardinal Kafara, she said, don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will be, always be fought and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. And then she concluded, however, Our Lady has already crushed his head. She said, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she shall be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. You know, I've been told before, and I believe it very strongly, that Ireland is a sign. St. Patrick sat on that rock for a long, long time to gain our Lord's promise to keep Ireland faithful. So when Ireland went for abortion, for same-sex marriage, I almost didn't believe it. But Ireland still has a role to play, and the fighters are in this room. You know, you've shown by this conference, you've shown by your being here, by organizing it, by working for it and donating for it, an example to all the rest of the world because we must be silent no more. We, may, we must not allow the abusers of our children to have the pedestal as they're having 10 minutes away. We refuse to stand by in silence as you abuse our children. We refuse to stand by in silence as you abuse our faith. We refuse to stand by in silence as you abuse our liturgies, and we refuse to stand by in silence as you abuse our Eucharistic Lord. May God bless you.